muddy countryside is littered with fragments from the mighty tank battles of the summer of 1944. This particular field, though, is special. It is the final battlefield of Germany's greatest panzer ace, Michael Whitman. Also known as the Black Baron, he destroyed 168 tanks in his career and became a hero of the Third Reich. Killed here on August 8, 1944, controversy still surrounds his death. Specifically, who fired the shot that claimed his life? Military historian Norm Christie and his team have come to Normandy to re-examine the evidence and determine once and for all who killed Michael Whitman. Sinto, Normandy, the site where Michael Whitman's remains were found in 1983. Over the years, many have claimed they killed the Black Baron. The British believe they fired the fatal shot. Quite frankly, I'm quite pleased that I got rid of it. Others believe Typhoon aircraft hit his tank with rockets. It was found with the turret blown off. Only a Typhoon could have done that while others think a Canadian tank hit him. I believe the Sherbrooke's did knock out Michael Whitman. To solve the mystery of who killed Michael Whitman, Norm Christie and his team will survey the battlefield from every angle, compare the armor of both sides, and re-examine the reports of the tank crews who fought in Whitman's final battle. The men of the Canadian Sherbrooke's, the British Northamptonshire Yeomanry, and finally, the German Panzer Corps, including Michael Whitman himself, the center of the controversy. Michael Whitman is born in 1914 and grows up a farm boy with ambition for greater things. At 19, Whitman joins the military and quickly makes his way up through the ranks. By the war's outbreak in 1939, he is serving in the Führer's own elite guard, the Liebstandarte Adolf Hitler of the Waffen-SS. Commanding a self-propelled gun, he quickly distinguishes himself on the battlefield, earning a reputation as a fearless leader. But this is only the beginning for Michael Whitman. In the spring of 1943, he is given command of one of Germany's most fearsome weapons, the Tiger Tank. Assigned to the Eastern Front, Whitman's bold tactics claim an impressive 56 tanks and artillery pieces in just over six months. By the end of January 1944, his overall tally soars to an amazing 100 kills. His exploits become headline news throughout Germany, dubbed the Black Baron by both friend and foe. In February, Whitman is decorated by Hitler himself, but for all the accolades, his greatest victory still lies ahead, battling the Allied invasion force on the Western Front. June 6, 1944, the Allies launch their invasion of Normandy. The German High Command quickly orders four divisions forward to reinforce the Normandy front, including the 2nd Company of the 101st SS Panzer Battalion, now commanded by Michael Whitman. On June 13th, as a column of British armor rolls in to occupy the village of villers bocage the Black Baron pulls up just outside town. Military historian Norm Christie retraces Michael Whitman's steps in villers bocage that day. I'm with Daniel Taylor, who's an expert on the Battle of villers bocage and he's going to explain what happened on June 13, 1944. So what was happening here with Whitman's Tigers? Well, they'd found themselves in this little lane. Um, they'd been advancing from Belgium uh, for about five or six days. The unit was strung out across hundreds of miles. They'd managed to get to here with five tanks. The place presents pretty good cover. So they're encamped along this lane? Yeah, dispersed along it, yes. So what happens in the morning? Well, uh, in the morning, uh, Whitman's roused by the, uh, the sound of tanks coming along the road. So they're literally, what, 200 yards away? About that. He'd have seen the, as the turrets went along that line. Right up on top of here? Up there, yes. Okay, so now Whitman, what's his reaction to this? Well, he's, he's got very few options left open to him. There's probably an argument about what he should have done, but what he decided to do was attack. I had no time for my company to 
musste schnell handeln. Ich fuhr los mit nur einem Panzer bis zur Säule und überraschte die Engländer genauso viel, wie sie mich überrascht haben. Whitman's come barreling across the field. First shot, takes out a firefly. He's hitting them from like 50 yards? If that, yes. Point blank range. So he's not going to miss. The rest of his unit is trying to engage a squadron up on the top of the hill you can see there. And he's come across the field and he runs into a column of transport. They all start bursting into flame. So now he's going to drive into town and he's leaving dead and burnt out vehicles behind him. So the guys in the village, do they know what's going to hit him? Absolutely not, no. It's, it, it's going to be a big rude surprise to them any second now. So Vitton's come down, he's run into these four Cromwell tanks, which you think might have a bit of a chance against him. He, he managed to get a couple of shots off at the Tiger before he's, he's taken out. They just bounce off. So they're bouncing off at, what, 50 yards? 50 yards, yards, no distance at all. The following Cromwell has pulled behind uh, this wall and pulled into the courtyard of that building. Right. That's commanded by a Captain Dias. I suddenly saw this tiger tank shooting down the main street. I got the driver to reverse our tank into a farmyard. And in the next moment, to my astonishment, with no gunner in our gunner seat, the tiger went right in front of me. Unfortunately for the Cromwell, the gunners just got out to have a pee. And so there's no way that he can fire. With the so he's missed side, a glorious chance. Glorious chance. The tiger's passing side on right in front of him. No way of firing. The tiger then passes on, turns into the high street. Another target rich environment. Whitman's rampage claims a total of 12 tanks and 15 other vehicles, all in a little under 10 minutes. Deciding not to push his luck any further, he retreats back through the village. So how many tanks and uh, soft skin vehicles did he get credited for this attack? Well, the Germans credited him with, with an entire regiment. In diesem Ort prallten die Panzer zusammen. In den engen Straßen wurde eine stärkere amerikanische Panzereinheit gestellt und zusammengeschossen. Seit dem ersten Tag der Invasion haben die Angloamerikaner rund 1000 schwere und schwerste Panzer verloren. Whitman's attack on the British is a huge gamble that pays off. With it, he single-handedly breaks the Allies' momentum and stalls their advance out of Normandy. For his actions at Villers Bocage, the Black Baron is once again decorated by Adolf Hitler. The ambitious farm boy has now become a living legend. But Whitman's luck is running out. In less than two months, the Third Reich's mighty Black Baron will be dead. Leaving behind an enduring mystery surrounding his death. In July 1944, the Allies launch a series of offenses on Kahn, attempting to push into the fields to the south. It is some of the most intense fighting of the entire Normandy campaign. As the months drag on, they advance only a short distance, suffering heavy casualties. And no one is hit harder than the Allied armor, which in only one month of battle loses more than 400 tanks. One of the first things we saw in Normandy was a knocked out Sherman tank. And it had gone up in flames as Shermans were infamous for exploding, going into a sheet of flame 20 or 30 feet high. The tank that we saw still had two or three of the crew sitting inside, but no longer recognizable as human beings. The Germans used to call us Tommy Cookers, because they burnt so easily. I became a fatalist overnight. And I'm glad I did, because I think that's the only way you could survive. And one at that point realized that we were in tremendous danger, because this was something that Germans could obviously do with their great guns. 
and one sword out, out, out the other, so I'd think of some of our tanks. But the Mayan thing was that they could knock out our tanks at a safe distance. And we had not been informed in any way that this is the fate that waited us just up the road. In your mind, every German tank was a tiger, because the tiger was a terror. And if it was a tiger, then you had to uh, fight for your life. Each one of us, you know, you had the jitters every time you saw the buggers because the gun was so much superior. Technically, the range needed to knock out a Tiger by a 75 was about two or three inches. The shots from 75 were bouncing off like ping pong balls. One thing we had in advantage was what we called a Firefly. It was still the normal Sherman, but the 75mm gun, uh, which was about six pounder, had been replaced by a 17 pounder. For the first time, we realized we now had a tank which was equal to the Tiger, and we were able to believe it. August 7th, 1944. More than 25,000 British and Canadian troops assemble for Operation Totalize, a major offensive devised to crack the German defensive line south of Cannes. Unlike previous operations, Totalize is planned as a night assault to confuse the Germans and limit their response. It begins at midnight, August 8th. The initial attack is a success, and in less than four hours, the Allies break through the German lines and begin advancing south. Progress in the dark is slow for some units, while others, like the Northamptonshire Yeomanry and the Sherbrooke Fusiliers, proceed quickly to their objectives. Isolated from the main force, they dig in for the inevitable German counterattack. And so it is, in the early hours of August 8th, that the stage is set for the Allies' final confrontation with the Black Baron. Northamptonshire Yeomanry is one of two armored units claiming to have killed Michael Whitman. To test their version of the event, Norm Christie must first pinpoint their exact position on the battlefield that fateful day. We know that in 1944, the Yeomanry hid in the orchard south of St. Aniel. But in 60 years, a lot of things have changed. For example, the orchards aren't there anymore, so we're going to have to try to determine where they were. And it's going to be a little challenging to try to find out exactly where everybody was. At 8 a.m. August 8th, the Yeomanry has reached its objective, Saint-Aignan, and is moving into the woods south of the village, where its units will take up defensive positions in case of a German counterattack. Today there's uh, no orchards and very little woods, but this whole area was wooded in 1944. And from here they got a commanding view of the area to the south and to the west. You can see the Route Nationale over here, and the Germans were further south. As the Yeomanry prepares its position, the Canadian Sherbrookes are also advancing west of the Route Nationale. Norm Christie will now pinpoint their exact position at the moment Michael Whitman was killed. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, go by the Canadian Cemetery. And just a little bit north of it is Gumiznell, which is a very, very small hamlet. And this is where, where the Sherbrooke set up. We know it was in a stone wall around an, an old chateau. Here's, looks like our wall. So this is our first entrance into Gumas Mill. So we'll go right into the middle of the hamlet and we'll ask where this chateau was. In his search for the old chateau, Norm Christie is directed by locals to the eastern outskirts of the hamlet of Gomez Mill, a short distance from the Route Nationale. Bonjour, monsieur. Bonjour, monsieur. Ça va? Ça va. Et uh, tu cherches pour le, le place pour le vieux 
château et la vue mur. Oui, voilà. Tout de suite, on est ici. Oui. Là, la maison. Et le vieux château, ici. Okay. Et un mur tout autour, comme ça. Le château, il a brûlé ah oui? avec les Anglais. Mais ce n'était pas l'aviation, ni, le, ni la, les chars, ni le... Euh, il a brûlé. C'est un accident. Euh, accident bête, oui. <rire> accident... Beaucoup... Merci, monsieur. Voilà. So, what's happened is the uh, old chateau was just north of here, and that the wall came around. It was a huge wall that went up to this area around about 30 meters down that way, then down to the, the main road. Then at the end of the war, the chateau burnt down. Apparently, a bunch of English soldiers got drunk and uh, they, the thing caught fire. So this is the correct wall. I want to see if I can get inside there to see exactly what the Sherbrooks could see on the day of the battle. I'm going to cut through here. So, that certainly looks like the wall we're looking for. If you look over here, you can actually see the work of the Sherbrooks. You can see the holes over there. Those are Sherman sized holes. And that's where they would have broken through. You can also see where they knocked down the wall, the firing height. And of course, this is where they set up some of their defensive positions. It gave them an incredible field of fire. And if the Germans wanted to attack from Syntho north, the Sherbrooks had them. The Sherbrooks were hiding behind here. But what's really exceptional about this is that they were so well hidden that no one even knew they were here. And even the histories of the war afterwards don't mention anything about the Sherbrooks being here. Walters had picked such a superb position that no one was ever going to find him. But what Radley Walters does not know is that a short distance to the south in the village of Sinto, an SS ops group, including Michael Whitman, is planning a counterattack. For the Germans, the situation is critical. Operation Total Eyes has broken their defensive line, decimating an entire division in the process. Now it threatens to cut off all remaining German units in Normandy. They have no choice but to strike back without delay to halt the Allied advance. Kurt Meyer, commanding the 12th SS Division, is ordered to launch a counterattack near the Route Nationale. Faced with overwhelming odds, Meyer calls upon the one man capable of turning the tide, the Black Baron. Kurt Meyer consults with Michael Whitman and other officers to plan a counterattack. Their main concern is a group of Canadian tanks massing for an attack on a ridge to the north. Meyer orders Whitman to take his Tigers and hit the Canadians in an attack similar to his famous action at villers bocage If Whitman can surprise the Canadians and throw them into disarray, he will buy valuable time for the Germans. At 11.30 a.m., Whitman shakes hands with Meyer and mounts his tiger. And at 12.30 p.m., he attacks. Norm Christie recounts the dramatic events on the fields outside Sinto that day. The plan called for five tanks to come across this field and two to go on the other side of the Route Nationale. Their objective was to get over the hill and hit the Canadian tanks that were massing there for the second phase of Operation Total Eyes. It takes them about 10 minutes to get into this area and bang, the first Tiger gets hit. In the meantime, Whitman is over by the Route Nationale. He must have seen this because his radio communication goes. Achtung! Achtung! Back von rechts! Back von rechts! The second tank goes up. It's brewed completely up in the air. And the third tank is disabled because they've hit the wheels of the track and it's trying to get out and it's retreating. In fact, it goes backwards across this field and bang, it goes up. So in a few minutes, the field is all burning wreckage. 
The men are climbing out of the turrets. They're bringing their wounded. They're trying to get out of here before they're shot down. And as they go by, they see Tiger number 007, and it's not moving, and its turret is askew to the east. In the aftermath, no one is sure exactly what became of the Black Baron. He is simply declared missing in action. At the time, the only clues to his fate are a few scattered reports from surviving German tankers. When I looked out to the left, I saw that Michael's tank wasn't moving. The turret was displaced to the right and tilted down to the front somewhat. When I got to within about 250 to 300 meters, as of flames suddenly shoot from the tank and the turret fly off and fall to the ground. These accounts would remain unsubstantiated for decades until a photo of the battlefield taken by a French farmer in 1945 confirmed at least some of the details surrounding the destruction of Tiger 007. Since then, more and more evidence has been surfacing in the field near Gomez Nil. C'est votre collection Voilà, c'est la collection. Les pièces euh, oui. par oui. le champ de bataille. Beaucoup de choses ramassées par mon père, oui. Non, vous, vous trouvez oui. toutes les pièces euh, et votre père Oui. Trouvées à quelle place Dans oui. le champ Oui. Ouais. Là où on a trouvé les corps, oui. Et, et, et toute la région aussi oh, pour aussi, les aussi, aussi, mais... Euh, voilà, je peux vous dire, certifier que celui-ci oui. vient de... Sur le champ de bataille. 007, oui, voilà. Oh, bon. C'est pas le plus beau, il est abîmé, mais... So, this is uh, remarkable to actually touch the pieces of our investigation. This is the real thing. L'arigophone, pas la gauche. Je... Voilà, j'ai plus besoin du micro. Ah, c'est ça, c'est ça. Oui, c'est ça. Uh, they would talk through uh, this part. So they talk to their throat and it would go out. It's quite unique to the Germans. Like... Il est probable qu'ils viennent du type de Wittmann. Oui, je pense. C'est cette pièce. Oh, oui, that's uh, oui. from uh, Whitman's Tiger. Wow. Look at that. Ooh. This is uh, an 88 armored piercing shell. So this is where the charge is, and they load it in the gun. Oh. Go. Oui, oui, oui. Avec le feu. That's why the Tiger was deadly. Cette pièce aussi, c'est une trappe qui était dans le fond de la tourelle. C'est le plancher de la tourelle. C'est le plancher, une partie du plancher de la tourelle, oui. Oui. Whitman, il a marché là. Oui. Yes, sir. Oui, oui. Pour la dernière fois aussi. La dernière fois, oui. Même sa femme a pleuré quand elle a vu cette pièce. Oui, c'est ça. Pas la photo, je pense. Voilà, c'est ce qui voilà, qui comble le vide du cercle, là. Oui, la grande explosion, mmh. fait comme ça. Oui. Et les pousse. Mmh. Et qu'est-ce que c'est ici C'est ceci, oui, c'est une toile que j'ai faite le, le même jour que les deux cercles de la tourelle. So this is a rocket fired from a typhoon that was found at a similar time as they, they dug up these pieces from the tiger. This uh, gives us another dimension of uh, who could possibly have killed Michael Whitman. These relics from Tiger 007 provide the first pieces of tangible evidence linking battlefield accounts with the photo of Whitman's wrecked tank in the field near Gomez Nil. But they still have yet to reveal what became of the Black Baron himself, and more importantly to the investigation, who it was that fired the fatal shot. To find answers, Norm Christie must reconstruct the battlefield, first by pinpointing the precise location where Whitman's tank was destroyed. So we're on the battlefield of August 8, 1944, right beside the Route Nationale. Michel, uh, qu'est-ce que vous trouvez en 83, ici? No, beaucoup plus, uh, ici, 60, 70 mètres. Environ 60 mètres, peut-être. Nous sommes vraiment Certainement sur l'endroit où le, les cinq hommes étaient. Avec les, qu -ce que les, les insignes de SS ou, euh... Oui, oui, sur le Vietman, oui, il y avait le, le, la veste encore okay. en cuir. So, what Michel has told us is that they found a few remains just below the surface here. First, some on top, a few fragments of bones, and then they called the German war graves in 
and they started to dig and they dug down and found more remains. They found Panzer tanker uniforms, uh, identity discs, a pistol that belonged to Michael Whitman found here. So they came to the conclusion that the remains found here were the collective remains of Tiger 007, which was Whitman's tank for the attack on August 8th. So now we know out of the four Tigers that were destroyed on this field, that the one here belonged to Michael Whitman. But the question remains as to who fired the fatal shot. Having established the positions of the Allied units, Norm will attempt to resolve whether it was the Yeomanry or the Sherbrokes that killed the Black Baron. From here we have the positions of the Sherbrokes. We know that they were located just behind the chateau. And of course we know that the Yeomanry were over there at St. Etienne. So we have that position and this position, which was the, the pinchers that caught the tiger attack. So now, using some aerial photographs taken in 1944, we can actually piece together the history of what happened to Michael Whitman. I'm with Jan Zhuo, and he's an expert on the battlefield here near Sintho, and he's going to help us put together the mystery of Michael Whitman. Let's look at what we got. This is the original photograph. So this shows the, how it was before. Now this area has changed quite a lot, hasn't it? Yes, yes, in large parts, yeah. But we do have the fields where the, where the four tigers were. Yeah. That's, we're okay there. That's where Whitman's remains were found. Yeah, close to the road. Where, yeah, and that's where Serge's photograph of 007 was taken. That's in correct. 1945. So the other part is where the yeomanry were. Now well, what's changed in this area? Particularly the orchards there, to the right uh, of Whitman's group. Right. Uh, most of them have gone, disappeared completely. So. We don't know exactly where they were, but we can do it within 50 yards. Oh, yes, I should okay. think so. So the next piece is, of course, the Sherbrooks. Now, that chateau and the wall, uh, a lot of that's all gone now, right? The Sherbrooks are going to be the challenge because we also don't, don't, don't know which Sherbrook took the shots. So let's go set it up and try to recreate this battle that really took place in about, what, 10, 12 minutes? Oh, yeah, at most. Let's go get the surveyor and find out what really happened. Okay. So this is the position where 007 was knocked out. This was Whitman's tank, and this is where we're going to start our investigation. So we're going to analyze the field from really a, a line of sight, yes. from the various positions to see what they could actually see. Right. And then we're going to use surveying and GPS to do the rest, to get our, our distances. So we can ask Vincent to set this as our original point, point zero, and then we'll go out and find the locations of the other tigers over here. So we'll head out and get to the one that was uh, due east first. All right. Using the aerial photographs of 1944, Norm plots the field positions of the four wrecked Tigers. The Yeomanry claims that their gunner, Joe Ekins, took out with them, along with two others. A remarkable feat, to say the least. Norm is returning to the Yeomanry's position south of saint Aignan to examine the battlefield from there to test the validity of the British claim. So let's look at it. So we got Sintho over here. Mm -hmm. Boom is now, okay, and we've got the yeomanry over here all set up, nicely dug in. So they're now they're ready for any counterattack, should there be one. And of course, the Germans usually did very quickly. We were by midday aware that the Germans had got to come. They couldn't leave us there any longer. There were four, certainly four tigers which came down on what would have been our side of the main road. I saw the three targets come in, quite cross in front of us, about 1,200 yards away. Our tank commander told us to wait till they get to about 800 yards. I was now starting to get a bit itchy. The tank commander said, advance driver, and we pull out of cover. As we pull out of cover, he says, um, target the rear target. Can't see very much. Um, he 
you're, you're looking through a periscope that big at uh, 800 yards, I mean, they're only that, they're tiny, you know. I fired. As we were reversing back into cover, I'd look round at the second tank that I was probably more frightened, but I was sort of thinking, get the bastards before they get me. I fired one shot at the second tank in line. He immediately blew up. The third one, the third one definitely was milling around looking for cover. As soon as I was ready to fire, then I fired. The Yeomanry are here. They claim there's three tigers coming up and they hit all three of them. Mm. So what's the danger area for a firefly? How far can they shoot effectively? Effectively, they would shoot at 800 meters, I would say. They could shoot at as far as uh, 1,200 meters. But from here, that would be a very, very lucky shot. Right. Um, I think we're looking at Fidman's Tiger there. Right. Was about a kilometer away. So that's, well, that's, that's been solved. Can you give me the third one? 767 meters. And the second one we did? 754 meters. Okay, 754. So that's this one. That's that one there. 754. How far to tank one? 775. 775, so that's within 800. That's, that's, that's a good right. distance yes. for a firefly. Now, how far is the Whitman one? 967. 967, so it's almost a, almost a kilometer, so yeah. 1,100 yards, which was at the very very top of the, of the range for the gun. There are several things to consider. These three tigers here in the line are the closest to, the, uh, to this place here where yeah. uh, North Central Yomari was located. So it would make sense for them to have taken them out first anyway, because they are within 800 meters range. So from here, you would see those three tigers very clearly on the horizon as they came across. But Whitman is over the rise down towards that white building over there, Gomez Nell. You know, maybe a lucky shot would go through. That'd be a very skilled shot. But that would mean they got four tigers. Yeah. So that doesn't fit with the belief of what, of what the omen we got that day. You can see why the three tigers would be sitting ducks, but the fourth one would be quite a challenge. Norm Christie is now travelling to Gomez Nil to locate the position of the Canadian tanks and survey the battlefield from their perspective to determine whether they could have fired the kill shot. So, these are the grounds of the old chateau, right? Yes. Now, the wall that surrounded it, most of the northern part is gone, but the southern part is still there. We, we found that the other day. So we know that the Sherbrooks came into this area. Now, your aerial photograph shows that they made holes some of the walls that were on the Route Nationale, which of course is right here. There's about two big holes we can see in this uh, wall. One would be uh, right in front of us, back right. here, and the other one would be a bit further to the left, on that side. We came here earlier to try to find out or look for proof that the Sherbrooks were here. We found small marks, but we didn't realize at the time how much of the wall was missing, and in specifically that there were breaks in the walls facing facing east towards where the Tigers would have advanced. There was a couple right on the road, and it was from that general area that the first German tanks came out from Sinso. Right away, I can remember the wireless net becoming active. I can see them, I can see them, there's some tanks coming. But with my eyes, I could see the tank closest to the road, about two, 200 yards, I guess. I didn't fire at him. Other people from my squad were firing at it now. I don't recall the actual tank blowing up by somebody firing at him. I can remember a tremendous explosion and seeing the turret hit the ground. Are you surprised to see how close we are to Whitman's tank? Yes, I am indeed, yeah. Uh, because even when you look at the aerial photograph, it's, um, it doesn't seem uh, so close. And we are actually standing in the field, looking over uh, from this side to where uh, Whitman's uh, tank was destroyed. It certainly looks very close indeed. 
So let's ask Vincent exactly how far we are from Whitman's tank. So Vincent, can you give me a uh, distance to Tiger number one, Whitman's? 143 meters. 143 meters. That's incredibly close. So we have this situation. We know where his tank was just over here. So we have the Sherbrooke's positions here and they're shooting in that direction towards Whitman's tank. Now you have a, a schematic of it. I showed a uh, drawing of a Tiger and Serge was actually able to draw the uh, precise area where he, he uh, observed a big impact, okay. which was located on the uh, left forward cooling grid. So this is left rear of Whitman's tank. So That's right. your trajectory would be very low here. Yes, it would. Because you're so close. Mm -hmm. So it's most likely then that would come from this position. Yes. And then it went in and gradually it ignited the fuel and the ammunition and the turret blew off. That's amazing. I'm surprised we're this close. I thought we'd be around 500 meters, and now we're 150. So really, it almost has to be the Canadians. Can you think of any alternative? Well, uh, Monsieur Varin, who took the photograph that we see here, is actually suggested that it could have been a, a Typhoon rocket, uh, because he photographed a non-exploded Typhoon rocket that was lying nearby the tank. The reason I would doubt it is a Typhoon rocket is uh, that A, they were rippled fire and weren't very accurate it would be very difficult to hit a tank. The second thing is that the uh, Typhoon rocket has several pounds worth of explosive, and if the rocket hit the Tiger, the rear of the Tiger would be blown apart. Right. So you wouldn't be able to see the hull in one so piece. So no, there's no evidence of really burning? In this no. no. There's just no proof that it happened. It's no. unlikely. So we're left with really one thing here. The Canadian. Sherbrooke's had to do it. Yes. Having examined the battlefield from the German, British and Canadian positions, it's now possible for the first time to reconstruct the Battle of Sinto and accurately recreate the attack that killed German panzer ace Michael Whitman. It is now clear that Joe Ekins, from his position near Saint-Agnon, did destroy three Tigers. But it is difficult to believe Ekins could have fired the shot that killed Whitman, especially in the face of strong evidence that indicates that the fatal shot came from the direction of the Canadian tanks at gomez -Nil. A position only 143 meters from the Black Baron's Tiger. Following the Battle of Sinto, the Allies push further south, continuing their advance against the remaining German units defending Normandy. In just 80 days, they completely encircle the retreating German army. The Battle of Normandy is all but over. In all, 100,000 men lose their lives, including 50,000 German soldiers. La Cambre Cemetery is the largest German memorial in Normandy. It contains 21,000 graves, including two Tiger commanders killed in action August 8, 1944. Military historian Norm Christie visits their graves. This is Willie Irion. He was the commander of one of the Tigers knocked out going across the field. And you can see it's a collective grave with some of his crew members here. These are always just partial remains uh, because of the fire inside the tank, as they say, brewed up. And there'd be very little after the battle to even bury. Uh, one tanker told me the story of burying his crew, and they buried them in a mess tin. Over 60 years after his death, Whitman's legend lives on. His grave stands out among the others, always adorned with fresh flowers. We should not forget what Whitman fought for. Sometimes we have a tendency to romanticize these people when they're really fighting for Adolf Hitler. This is Whitman's collective grave here, and this is where his partial remains were put in 1983. They had a large ceremony and Whitman's widow came to it and they honored him and they continue to honor him. Michael Whitman lived his life on the edge. He became famous because of his willingness to take risks, to take advantage of opportunities. But for him to make that charge, 
towards the Canadians on Hill 112 was suicide. I have a feeling that Bettman have been in the war so long that when it got to that point, they were realizing that the war was lost. And whether his last thoughts as he went down the road were simply Valhalla, here I come. The Sherbrooke's did knock out Michael Whitman. And you didn't make very much of it. None of us knew who the hell this guy was. <laughs> he uh, accepted the doctrines of uh, Hitler enough to uh, get in his tank and, and invade other people's countries, left country after country. Anybody who, who goes into another person's country to kill is a criminal. I'm afraid uh, he might have been a hero to the Germans, but uh, not to me.